Hello, welcome to The Drum. I'm Julia Baird. Coming up, sweeping changes to sexual assault laws in New South Wales and a new model for what constitutes consent. From homelessness to winding up in the justice system, a new report lays bare the failures of foster and out of home care. And it's being called the astronomical phenomenon of the year. We will tell you how to catch a glimpse of the super blood moon. And joining me on the panel tonight, CEO of ID Know Yourself, a not-for-profit mentoring organisation that supports Aboriginal young people in out-of-home care, Isaiah Dorr. Welcome, good to have you back. Going good, Charlie. Good day, thank you. Associate lecturer in the School of Education at Macquarie University. You will recognise her from her multiple appearances, Amy Tunick. Good Yala, to see you. Thank you. In Melbourne, senior fellow at the University of Melbourne School of Government and former Victorian Liberal MP, John Pizzuto. Welcome to you, John. Good day, Julia. And in Brisbane, Professor in, in the Centre for Justice at the Queensland University of Technology, Kerry Carrington is back. Great to have you. Good afternoon, everyone. If you want to join in on Twitter, you just have to use the hashtag TheDrum, and we are also on Facebook. Now, where did you have this on your list of unlikely political alliances? The Greens have joined forces with former Liberal-turned-crossbencher Craig Kelly to force companies who turned a profit during the pandemic to repay JobKeeper payments they received. Greens leader Adam Bant tabled amendments that mean any businesses with a turnover of more than $50 million and whose profits increased during the pandemic would have to return the funds. At a time when the budget says workers are getting a wage cut and the unemployed are living in poverty, we should not be giving handouts to billionaires. Billionaires and big corporations who made profits and bought private jets do not need handouts from the government including JobKeeper handouts. And they should pay it back because there is at least a billion dollars, billion with a B, there to be reclaimed. Some companies like Toyota, Super Retail Group and Domino's have returned their payments. Others, such as Solomon Liu's Premier Investments, returned a portion, despite increasing profits and issuing dividend payments to shareholders. Then there are companies like Eager's Automotive, which drew $130 million in JobKeeper payments, whilst also turning a profit of $156 million. It, along with retail giant Harvey Norman, have so far defied calls to repay the money. What is the right thing to do here, Amy Tunick? Oh, I don't know. I kind of feel like I'm on the fence with this one. Mm -hmm. I just don't know how comfortable I am with them backdating the terms and conditions. Um, I, I, I just don't feel but that wasn't it wasn't always going to be a temporary measure and if they ended up making a profit and didn't need it? Was that specified? If that was specified, totally. But if it wasn't, I just don't know about that. Mm. I'm just not sure. John Pizzuto, what would be Look, the impact of making this legislation to claw that money back? Well, it would be pretty unprecedented, Julie, because we, we've got to remember, and this is a part of the public debate that I think really leaves politics a bit diminished, I personally would like to see more companies that did really well during the harshest periods of COVID and the operation of JobKeeper return what they received or as much as what they received if they did really well. But we've got to remember right across the government accounts, there are you know, companies galore that receive government money. And if we value the idea of consistency and reliability, uh, we've got to remember that lots of companies that do really well with CEOs and executives who get paid bonuses and a lot of money rely on taxpayer dollars. So if you're going to start broaching these types of policy ideas, do it not in a vacuum for the immediate sugar hit of a news story. Think about the issue and ask about, well, when governments do give money and governments across the board of all political persuasions, federal and state and local, give lots of organisations that are highly profitable money to conduct and operate major projects or deliver major programs. Just think about the underlying principles. So I, I wouldn't support a legislative mechanism to require companies retrospectively to repay the money. But I'll tell you what would be worth discussing is when governments do give money to large corporations, what are we going to expect in return for mm. that? And maybe there's a discussion there. Mm. Mm. It wasn't, though, the pandemic an anomalous situation on, like, so many fronts. I mean, you're talking about, you know, all these people that receive government assistance, but that's year by year by year by year by year. This was a big blast of money, and we're talking about a billion dollars here. 
Well, well, that is exactly right. But rem let's go back to first principles when everybody was calling for a JobKeeper type system to be implemented. What was the primary objective of the program? It was to stop employers by giving them the support they would need who would otherwise let staff go. And that question at that time could not have been answered with the benefit of hindsight now. Uh, it had JobKeeper not been introduced, and remember at its peak, JobKeeper was supporting about three and a half to four million Australian mm -hmm. jobs. So there are a lot of people relying on it. Let's just ask ourselves, if it, if it were not implemented, what would the effect have been? And even with those companies that did really well, we can say that now with hindsight, but let's remember at the time, we were all concerned about what would happen to jobs across the economy. Kerry, what's the ethical thing to do here? Oh, very clearly the ethical thing is for them to donate the money back. Um, and last year we saw an absolute surge in domestic and family violence across Australia. We saw a sector absolutely um, flat, strapped, and we saw we've had Brad Chillicott, who's the executive director of White Ribbon, he's called upon that money to be dedicated to um, addressing the national crisis of domestic violence against women. And don't forget, one in six women and one in 25 men have been victims of sexual assault in Australia, and one in three women have been a victim of domestic violence at some time in their life. So, you know, that's millions. You're talking millions of Australians who could be, who could be, um, um, who could be helped with this funding. I say, what would you do with a billion dollars? A billion dollars? I mean, I don't uh, mean just like <laughs> what kind of houses would you buy? I mean, were oh. you in a, in a politician? Uh, you know what? I think uh, to Kerry's point as well, you know, to invest that back into the communities um, who are particularly uh, impacted by COVID. I know a lot of not-for-profits who are impacted by it mm -hmm. and, and donate it back to the, to the community who are doing the incredible work, especially, as Kerry said, around mental health, um, yeah. you know, particularly with our young people. Um, you know, my heart still goes out to those kids who are who their safe place was the local park or their, their safe place was the school, um, you know, and, and they had to be stuck in, in this, in the isolation there, you know, and the mental health and the trauma that has been mm. impacted by that. So, you know, there's desperately, um, there's desperately needed some um, investment back into the community to, mm. to help get our people back to, to where we were. I think, um, you know, we've still got a long shot to go and I think that, that money should be, you know, incentivised in, in many ways to, to give back. Mm. They're quite different conversations though because I fully agree with that and that would be a fantastic thing to see but is the conversation the money should go back and it would be reinvested or would it go back and we've got an election coming up and they'd be able to play with the books a bit like I think it's a fantastic opportunity for businesses to put that money into non-profits mm. I think it's a wonderful opportunity for a commitment to be made for that money to go into that for the public to see that but I just don't know that that's the discussion and the idea of a very specific piece of legislation for that particular portion when we know that a lot of businesses are funded and supported through public money mm. I'd rather see the conversation look at that the mm. fact that this is something ongoing and what should it look like going forward rather than a dedication time specifically focusing on that so what kind of impact do you think if we have um, the Greens saying this is just a, was a fund for billionaires, there were, you know, um, bonuses paid, dividends given out, and Anthony Albanese was saying, here we have allegedly told his MPs, if we gave the sort of money that this government did to people who didn't need it, we would have been smashed. They're terrible at looking after taxpayers' money. We know the value of every dollar. Do you think that's going to translate into kind of commun public sentiment, a kind of resentment about that? I think it should, but I don't know that it will. And I think part of that is the framing. Like if the conversation is they're going to make businesses that relied on JobKeeper give the money back, because that's how I've seen it framed up in different spaces today. I think instead it, it panics people because we are in this position of economic uncertainty. You know, our vaccination rates are very low. We've got little outbreaks here and there. Like we're not out of it yet. And so I think it's a, almost a dangerous time to be pushing that narrative because of the way it will be spun against the Greens. Um, and it, that's not really who should cop the flack for what's happened. Mm -hmm. All right, on to something else now, because it's time to get ready for a little cosmic magic. The moon is set to glow red tomorrow night. The super blood moon will be visible just after 9pm Australian Eastern Standard Time. So what exactly causes it apart from magic? We spoke to ABC News Breakfast weather presenter Nate Byrne to find out. 
So a supermoon happens when the moon is the biggest that it can appear in the sky. It changes its distance from the Earth a little bit, about 50,000 kilometres, because its orbit isn't exactly circular, it's a, it's a bit of an ellipse. And when it's closest, it can be perhaps as much as 30% brighter, maybe 14% bigger in the sky, but it's really hard to spot the difference with the naked eye. Nevertheless, when it gets to that closest point, it, it can look pretty impressive. Now this one is particularly impressive because it's coinciding with a lunar eclipse. Now that's when the Earth gets between the Sun and the Moon, so the Moon ends up in the Earth's shadow. But because we've got an atmosphere and because the Moon's relatively close, some of the light leaks through the atmosphere just like on sunset and sunrise. The, the Sun's just skimming the horizon and so it ends up pushing red light behind the Earth, and that lands on the Moon, which gives it this gorgeous red, the almost ruby glow. We're all going to get a view of this super blood moon, unless you're covered with cloud, and we've got a little bit of wild weather around at the moment. Uh, it's, it's going to vary depending on exactly where you are on the continent, but good news as well, this time, we're getting the lunar eclipse fairly early in the evening. So for most of us, we probably won't even be in bed yet, although, I will be, because breakfast television. Maybe, maybe I'll stay up late. If you're in the eastern states, so Queensland, New South Wales, ACT, Victoria and Tasmania, about quarter to eight is when you're going to see the moon starting to darken. It will be a total eclipse. That's when it's as red as it's going to get from about 10 past nine to just before 9.30 p.m. And then the event is all over around 10 to 11. Further west you go, the earlier things get. So if you're in South Australia or the Territory, looking about quarter past seven for the eclipse starting, it's gonna be fully red at about 8.40 to 8.55, and then it's all over about 20 past 10. And if you're in the west, well, you get the earliest of all, quarter to six, the partial eclipse starts. From 10 past seven to just before 7.30 is when it's going to be really red. And then the whole thing's over for the Australian mainland and about 10 to 9 p.m. There are more than 47,000 young Australians in out-of-home care. They might have experienced physical or sexual abuse, neglect or other trauma that we can only imagine. And with a limited number of foster homes, most end up in residential care or live independently. But when they turn 18 and the time comes to leave care, well, for many, there are no clear pathways. The drum Stephanie Bolchi has spoken to two young people who've traversed the difficult path out of care. I was told by my NGO that I would get a mentor that would teach me things like budgeting, how to shop, um, how to find a house. Um, however, that never happened. So I was feeling a little bit nervous and a little bit unprepared, but um, knowing that I had my foster family to fall back on meant that I was a little bit less nervous. They're all top caseworkers, except, you know, um, I only saw one for like six weeks and then she left. And in Syria again, I was like, where'd you go? So if it wasn't given to me by the caseworker, it was given to me by my nan, my foster carer in the case. What sort of supports did you get? Uh, life skills. Even like in, in school, she would always ask, you know, hey, the boys need tutoring, um, can we get a tutor? And then they would say yes. When I turned 18, they said, if you're going to live here, um, you're going to pay $50 a week in rent and you're buying your own food. And at the time I was like, oh, really? But now I'm like, that got me prepared for budgeting when I left home. I was doing HSC at the time and my nan said, you know, most, most carers would be uh, getting rid of kids, but, you know, you're free to stay here as long as you want. And I was pretty good. I knew I can't stay there forever. I have to grow up. So, yeah, I did grow up and I moved out. I did feel like I had to leave, but that was for myself. Even throughout high school, I was very independent. I, I wanted to do things for myself. For the financial plan, you start planning that as you get close to leaving care. I believe mine started when I was 
17 and it was just a series of meetings to sort of get a feel of what you're going to do when you leave care. I got my financial plan the day after I turned 18. Unfortunately, not a lot of uh, young people get that. Um, it's either years later or I know people who have never even heard of the financial care plan. When I got the plan, it didn't have as much as I thought I would have, like things that I didn't think I would need. I think on my first tour, I felt like moving out, but I was like, oh, I'm kind of lucky, so I'm not going to go. But then she said, like, you know, your brother's moving out, you can move out too. You've both got support. My brother got the support from, uh, from, from Docs. He gave them his own a unit um, through another agency, and I ran through the agency too, and uh, me and my brother have my own house, I mean, our own unit. It was very hard to find a place um, that was in our budget, but also would accept two young people with casual jobs. One of the, the girls I grew up with, uh, she has been living out of a suitcase um, for five or six years now. I have had friends who were really, really, really worried during COVID and they had their 18th birthday during the big lockdown we had and they had to find a rental um, with very little support during COVID and that, I can't imagine how terrifying that would be. So those are just two stories, but when it comes to the reality of transitioning out of care, the statistics are stark. A survey of more than 300 people aged 18 to 25 who experience care found that in the last decade there's been little improvements. In 2009, 35% of kids in care finished Year 12. Now here there's been an improvement, but it's still only 57% who are finishing school. 37% find themselves in the justice system while in care, while just over 20% do after leaving. And almost a third of young people experience homelessness in the first year after leaving care. You've been nodding all the way through throughout this, Isaiah. Um, you grew up in care. What, what was that experience like for you? Yeah, it was, it was terrible. Um, I, and I wouldn't necessarily call, call it care, you know. Mm -hmm. um, I, for me, it's, it wasn't child protection. It was, if anything, child rejection. You know, for myself, I grew up in care from the age of two months old till I was 17. Mm -hmm. I don't say 18 because when I was 17 years old, I was heading back on the boarding school bus uh, to school. Fortunately, I lived there. Um, but, you know, I looked down at my phone and I got a text message from my carer saying, you're no longer able to live here, pick up your bags from foster care. And so at 17 years old, I was homeless. Yeah, wow. I had nowhere In to a go. second, no consultation, no advance warning, nothing. Nothing. Pick What'd up your bags. Well, I stayed at friends' houses and, and uh, couch soft in, in the holidays and eventually met this amazing family who, who took me and my younger sister in. Um, but, you know, in that time in care, I didn't know any of my family members. I didn't know where I was from. I didn't have any connections or um, even I didn't know how to, how to cook, clean, budget, hygiene. Uh, I didn't even have a resume, so I right. didn't even know what I wanted to do after school. So 17, I was stuck. You know, I, I didn't know what I wanted to do in my life. Um, and you had been through a number of homes, right? Yeah, yeah. I went, I went through 17 different foster homes. Um, and, you know, unfortunately, and I, as, I, as you were saying, I was nodding a lot because those statistics is is that cycle that I'm, I'm helping break for only yeah. my personal family, but yeah. also the work we do at ID Know Yourself, you know, supporting our kids and making sure, and that's the kind of, that's the reason why I started ID, mm. to make sure that no other young person has to go through what I had to go through. Because mentoring is so crucial. Yeah, like, absolutely. And what's the most important part of the mentoring aside from the care? Yeah, I think it's strong relationships, yeah. you know, trusting relationships with adults and, and uh, as, as, as it was said, you know, m many kids who, who grow up in at-home care have been abused in one way, shape or form. So it's about how do we help our kids build up their, their empowerment and their healing journey um, through all that trauma that they've been exposed to. And, and the best way to do that is through positive relationships. Mm. And that's why it's so crucial to have role models and, and mentors because, you know, the kids go out go without families majority of the time. Um, they, they don't have parents and, and parents are usually the people who teach you about your morals, your, your ethics, your values. And if you don't have those people in your life, then, then who's gonna really help you along that journey? Right. And it sounds like you weren't, just weren't really given very basic information that could allow you to form an identity. Yeah, exactly. Right. And that's what it's about. It's about, you know, culturally as well, it's about 
connecting our kids back up to their culture and 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 where they're from because you know as my, our old people have said you know if you have a greater a greater understanding on on where you come from you have a greater idea on where you need to go in your life and and that's what it's about trying to give these kids a um a a better life experience as as children as they should do you know with trusting adults to support them along the way yeah and Amy, you grew up in a family that needed more support than it actually got. Yeah, so I was um, uh, homeless from 15. Um, and my experience with, it's interesting when we look at those stats and they talk about being in care, because as, as I said, it doesn't mean they're being cared for. It means that they're registered within the system. Yeah. Um, when I was 15, um, my parents were in a position, just a really difficult position, you know, they needed some supports. And so um, I wasn't living with them. And when my year advisor worked out that something was going on, because when you're not, uh, when you don't have access to that kind of stable familial home, you know, you're looking at things like um, being able to wash a uniform, being able to purchase a uniform, um, doing things like that become really difficult. So it can become visible. Uh, and my year advisor took me to the principal and we had a meeting, um, a closed door meeting, where they actually rang community services on loudspeaker in front of me, which at the time was horrifying um, but looking back I think they were trying to include me and build trust with me um, and community services said is she attending school and they said yeah she's doing her best to get here is she in immediate danger no no one wants a teenager so we're not doing anything and so for me then when I shifted to fully homeless as 16 I knew there was nothing for me to access no support so I was working 30 plus week, hours a week at McDonald's <laughs> for about $5 an hour. Yeah. Um, but it meant that going to school, I would often work the open shift and then I would go to school or I would go to school and then I'd work the closed shift. So you're not able to do your homework. You're in full survival mode. Yeah. And my parents are not abusive people. My parents are wonderful people. They were having a difficult time. Mm -hmm. And this is when we talk about these systems and the problems of them. Community services is under-resourced and families are over-policed and children who experience care and age out of care are not provided with the resources they need. And so we have this huge mix of, of people who are hurt and who hit burnout and who aren't supported with the resources that they need to become the functioning adults that we need from an economic standpoint. Mm. You know, like when it gets to the bottom line, the financial cost of kids in care, if we were supporting families better rather than criminalising things like substance abuse, if we took a harm minimisation approach, for example, then people who had substance abuse issues who were also parents could would be more likely to be able to access appropriate support. Mm. But to do that now brings you to the attention of the systems. And in terms of kids in care coming in contact with the criminal justice system, well, yeah, because if you want shelter in a storm, maybe you need to break an inner. If you're hungry, maybe you need to shoplift. Mm -hmm. And we already know that Indigenous kids are taken from their families at a much higher rate mm -hmm. and they're also policed at a much higher rate. And so it's just this huge collision of just horrible systems and a lack of community care um, that results in, in more hurt people being in the position that Isaiah is talking about, where then you need, you need trusting adults and you need... Um, you know, which I, I have that, I want to be very clear. Yep. I'm in a great place with my parents and they're in a much better place, but that's just an example of kids. A time of need. A time of need yep. and how, you know, often people dehumanise kids who are in care and also their families and they see them as, oh, they're bad people. No, maybe they're incarcerated, maybe they've got mental health issues, maybe they're sick and they don't have the supports they need mm. physically. Maybe there's disability issues. Like there's a range of factors there that I think we need to better understand as a society to support appropriately. Let alone an outright rejection of a teenager. Yeah. Just have not got capacity in the system for someone who is willing to work 30 hours a week at McDonald's mm. to get through school. Yeah. Well, for any teenager. Now you've also fostered kids yourself. Yes. How, what's that experience like, kind of being on that, that the other side? The system's worse than I imagined. Yeah. In what way? <laughs> um, children are so wonderful um, that if you have, you know, a loving heart and patience, you can meet with and support and offer a home to children no matter what they've been through. The problem is that there is this huge turnover of social workers and there is no communication and you can have children in your care who need medical assistance and, and who need therapy, but you're not technically their guardian um, and you're expected to pay for everything out of pocket. Mm. So it's this broken, flawed system that just chews you up and spits you out as a carer. And so I'm not, I'm not surprised that the numbers are low um, because they make it incredibly hard 
to to do it well long term. Um, all the children who have come to me through formal care or kinship care have been reunified with family, um, which is always the best thing, particularly for Indigenous kids. Um, but as carers, it was so hard, not because of the children or their needs, but because of the system we had to deal with. Right, which takes us back to that billion dollars we were talking about before. Now, Kerry, you did a PhD on young female offenders in 1989. We were talking just then about how over the period of a decade, not there has been some improvement, but not very much. How do the figures today compared to what, what you were looking at at that time? Okay, um, well, there's no improvement over several decades, unfortunately. Mm. Um, my study was a uh, 1,046 uh, young female offenders um, and over half of them had been what was called then state wards, you call them kids in care today. And um, over over half of them, uh, many of them disproportionately Indigenous, like Amy was saying, over-policed, um, stolen from Indigenous families. There was a disproportionate Indigenous. Um, and many of them ended up with um, long careers in the criminal justice system. And it's what we call the fast track from care to detention. And I noticed from this study today, the 56% of the kids who were in residential care who did this survey, that's over half, had involvement with youth justice. Mm. Now, resi care kids are in a very vulnerable position because when they're put in residential care, they're, they're not treated as children. They're mm. treated as as basically when, 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 um, when the workers have problems with them, there's a predisposition to just simply call the police. Uh, and then the police come and charge them. And this is no, this happened in, in cases I examined 30-odd um, years ago, but um, we've been doing more recent research and we found exactly the same is happening and occurring now. And there are serious problems in the system where they just call the police instead of, like if you were a normal loving family, you wouldn't call your the police if you were having an argument with a child and a child threw a cup of tea at your um, at the wall or happened to smash something. Well, unfortunately, when you're in resi care and places like this, that's what happens. And they get charged with um, um, assault and um, um, and protection and sorry, property offences. So it is, it is, as Amy says, the system is really flawed. John Pizzuto, you've had some experience looking across these systems as, as when you were Shadow Attorney General. What, what's your view, particularly when it comes to the intersection with the justice system and the high number who go straight from care into the system? Oh, it's incredibly, yeah, it's incredibly high, Julia, and it's unmistakable, the connection. And I, I don't think any government yet, certainly from a Victorian perspective, um, at a headline level, uh, you know, we're not nearly anywhere near where uh, we're mastering early intervention. Uh, our system in Victoria, and I, I suspect it's very similar in other jurisdictions, is that it's crisis driven. So I think, as, as Amy might have said, uh, you know, things often have to get really bad before um, households get the support they need and carers and, and kids get the support they need. Whereas if you get that earlier intervention so that things are managed before they deteriorate uh, and made worse, uh, that's, you know, that's obviously the goal. But we had a report, uh, I think it was back in 2012, the Cummins report in Victoria, which talked about early intervention, and we're nowhere near there. One of the tragic st statistics in Victoria in the last year has been that you know, 65 vulnerable kids died, and that's, you know, that's up significantly on previous years. So um, the system, I think, is in crisis and we're not investing nearly mm. enough in the early stages of that. Yeah. Mm. Isaiah, can I go back to the, the question of um, people leaving and not going straight to homelessness or being exactly in the position that you were in? Like, yeah. what can be done to prevent that? Some people are arguing that, that the time should be extended, yeah. that, that they should be able to be in care for longer or just better equipped yeah, it's it's kind of twofold. I mean, for me, when I was growing up in care, I couldn't wait till I got out of care. I was like, I cannot wait. And, you know, they used to use the unhumanising term, ward of the state, um, you know. But, yeah, for me, I was just like, I want to be, I want to be 18. I don't want to... Because I guess the main thing for a kid in care, you know, you never ever asked, like, you know, where do you want to live? 
it's always like where the caseworker can find, you know, a place for you and, and all that. And, and you don't really have a choice in care. You're placed here, you're placed there, you can't contact your family, you have no choice in care. And so for me, I just wanted to have that choice and I just wanted to get out of the system. Yeah. And so for me, I, I, I think I, I wanted to get out of the system and have my own, own, own kind of self-determination, but then also I wanted to have that kind of safety net around me and have someone there to support me on the journey. But I didn't have that in my entire time of care. So it's kind of like mm. I wanted to get out so I could, you know, right. fend for myself, but then also I'm not going to have any support, but I don't have any support now. And yeah. so I think the best kind of solution to it is just improving the better you know the, the the outcomes for our kids in care and the quality of life and experiences for them and and the best way to do it is is by you know connecting these kids up to establish their belonging discover their purpose mm -hmm. and empower positive decisions and that's what we do at id mm -hmm. and that's our purpose to break this vicious cycle yeah. where we talk about juvenile justice homelessness rates where we talk about kids not learning about their culture or where they're from um not finishing high school or going to further tertiary studies you know that's these kids are the most disadvantaged kids in this country, and you know it is. It is. It's such a. Um, it's such a big issue, and we need to tackle it now. Otherwise, generations and generations are going to suffer as well. Mm. Yeah, and yeah. these kids are generate like they have the potential to be cycle breakers, right? Like a lot of the kids who end up in care come from endemic poverty, or they come from um, generational trauma. And if we're equipping and we're empowering these young people. You know, even, okay, we need to do the early intervention care, we need to support families. But for those who do need the support, who do need to be away from that family unit, if we're supporting them, little things like being able to get your license. If you don't have anyone to teach you, those lessons are expensive. Being able to budget, giving them a stable home where they can have self-determination and agency, and providing them through systems like Isaiah's to build those relationships with appropriate and strong mentors. We are actually empowering them to be generational cycle breakers, which is going to be better for our entire society, our economy, everyone benefits if we support these kids and their families who are vulnerable. Mm. And so it's not just a cliff at the yeah. end of your time with a family or at the end of your time like in the system. Mm. Um, but it's intensive work for you, isn't it? Isn't it? Like it's a yeah. lot of time and a lot of one-on-one. -on -one. Like you just, you work with what, a handful or several people yeah. at once? Yeah. yeah, absolutely, yeah. So we've got 30 kids in the program at the moment. Yep. Uh, and the, the ages that we work with, the kids from seven years old all the way to, to 19 years old. Um, 19 being because, you know, we don't want to just support our kids um, once they turn 18, be like the system and clap their hands and say, job's done. Mm. You know, we know that these kids need the support and if anything, 19 is even as short as it is. Um, you know, these kids need consistency. I think, you know, as you were saying before, like these kids need, um, they need that consistency and the stability. Mm. Um, homelessness is huge. I mean, we've got a lot of kids who are 18 and, and have shifted to multiple places, but I, can I, I just don't, I can't imagine, you know, the kids who, are referred to us and we, we're able to get into the life after care plan. So we're able to get funding so we can support them um, mm -hmm. along their journey when they're 17 uh, and then after they're 18 years old. So we're not like DCJ and uh, right. we're, we're finished now, yeah. go fend for yourself. Cause the kids aren't ready. Like they're literally not ready. Yeah. Um, they don't know how to get a job. They don't know how to you know find a house. They, um, you know, a lot of our kids as well have been referred from Koori Court. So, mm -hmm. you know, juvenile justice background and, you know, these kids, it's, 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 a, it's a big cycle mm. that we're tackling here. Mm. Um, but a lot, what people can do about it is you know, be a foster carer. You know, be a foster carer. Um, support our kids and not just kick them out when they're, they're um, or take in the kids as, as little fellas, but even the, the older kids, the teenagers who desperately need someone just to come in there and be that support and, and, and role model in their life so they can break this cycle. Because mm. the majority of the kids who are in care their parents have probably been in care. Yeah. You know, this, right. this is an intergenerational thing that just needs to stop. Right, which is why what you've done is so important, Amy, when you are fostering and then making sure they're reunited with their family. I mean, that's pretty uh, amazing. Well, that's the goal. Yeah. Um, and some of them, I'm, you know, I still have contact with them and I get to keep up to date with them. Um, but yeah, like it's a big job and I think we really need systemic change and, and all of the reports, all the information's there. The government knows what we need funding for. They just need to do it. All right, you are watching The Jerome with me on the panel, CEO of ID Know Yourself, Isaiah Dorr, Associate Lecturer in the School of Education at Macquarie University, Amy Tunig, in Melbourne, Senior Fellow at the University of Melbourne School of Government and former Victorian Liberal MP, John Pizzuto, and in Brisbane, Professor in the Centre for Justice at the Queensland University of Technology, Kerry Carrington. 
The New South Wales government has today announced a historic overhaul of sexual assault laws. The state will adopt an affirmative consent model, meaning you have to get consent before moving forward with a sexual act. To make it clear that there cannot be consent unless the party in question has said something or done something to communicate consent. This is about holding perpetrators to account. But more than that, it is about changing community behaviour. It is about having a society where people ask simple questions. Uh, are you consenting? Where consent is affirmative, where consent is sought and not just assumed through lack of protest or, or lack of uh, physical uh, reaction has also pledged to implement all of the 44 recommendations made by the Law Reform Commission's Consent in Relation to Sexual Offences report. Now, it's hoped the changes will result in higher conviction rates, with currently just 3% of rape cases in New South Wales resulting in convictions. I spoke out in March this year about consent and about the issues about sexual violence and how I felt the state was failing, particularly female victims. Since then, we've had 898 adults come forward reporting sexual violence. We've been able to prosecute, prosecute less than 10% of those cases. Rape and sexual assault advocate Saxon Mullins has hailed the changes as a small win for victim survivors like herself. I'm grateful that my case was the catalyst for this reform. But I also recognise that there are many survivors who are not afforded the same opportunity that I was. Not only is law reform a significant step, we also must take the steps to ensure that all survivors' voices are heard and their justice is sought, whichever way that is for them. Extraordinary advocacy by Saxon Mullins. For more on this, we're joined in Wollongong by defence lawyer and former police prosecutor Patrick Schmidt. Welcome back to The Drum. Thank you, Julia. Now, Patrick, how will these changes affect you as a defence lawyer? Will it make life more difficult? Well, something needed to be done. It's at the point where if you've got a 3% conviction rate um, when there's so many complainants, there's an obvious issue. Now, the background to these laws is con consent must be communicated and it must be positively communicated. The gist is... Basically, the trial is now going to focus on not whether the victim resisted the accused, but there's going to be more of an emphasis on what positive steps uh, the victim showed to establish consent. Now, there's also going to be to establish a reasonable belief of the accused. The accused party will have to show their steps that they've taken to establish that the other party was consenting. Now, I can see the frustration in relation to the police investigating such matters. But I believe that there needs to be more done in relation to education to go with the legislation. Mm. Now, the problem with positive consent is whether or not it's practical. Um, is it going to be done by an app? Is it going to be done by a signed agreement? How's the proof going to come about? Is it going to be a situation where we're going to need a third party to witness the agreements of the transaction? Why would you need a, why would you need a third party? Well, intoxication is a major issue in relation to these count, uh, these cases, and the situation arises quite frankly. There's there's a definite power imbalance if one person is intoxicated and the other isn't, and that's clear. But what happens if both parties are intoxicated? That means both parties aren't capable of consent in, in relation to... We don't actually know what this positive consent or, or how it's going to come about. Does that mean then uh, both parties are, are, are potentially liable for prosecution for failure to consent in such matters? Now, the other issue is, in relation to it, does that also mean that the police have to enforce uh, this knowledge on reasonable suspicion? which will then cause significantly more problems as well, the investigating police in relation to, to chasing rabbits down holes and not, and not focusing on the, on the true victims. But if you're saying it needs a third party, which is what it, it's been the case with rape for millennia, frankly, people always mm. say that someone else needs to have seen it because the question is the testimony mm. of the woman involved, it will never yes. be... It, 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 will, it will never work. Because there very no. rarely is a third person. So that means the system would not change. 
Well, exactly right. In such a personal setting, how can you establish, and that's the same with how are you going to set up this agreement? Is it going to be a click of an app and then you've got the other problems? Is, has somebody logged into the phone and, and clicked the app? Is it a signing of a document? Um, I don't think it's meant to be is either, it, isn't it? It's just they have to have said or done something to indicate consent. It's not an app, it's not a document. It is, it is, it is seeking to, like, to do or say, yes, I'm OK, or whatever it is. The onus just shifting mm. in that way. But that, that's been the law all along in relation to positive consent, in consenting to um, sexual encounters. But the issue is, and the reason why we, there's such low percentages in relation to conviction rates, is proving that that consent didn't exist. Now, that's where it needs to... And that's what my understanding of this law is, to bolster that and to give the judges um, new directions in relation to making it easier uh, to prove uh, whether or not consent has taken place. Yeah, I want to get to those directions in just a second, but Kerry Carrington, do you want to come in and, and, and comment on, on that? Yes, indeed. I actually think this is a welcome development. It's it's um, like Saxon Mullins. I do believe that it is a step forward. Um, uh, and what it does is it takes away the one of the biggest problem, one of the serious problems of the of the sexual assault trial, whereby the um, perpetrator or the alleged perpetrator can can claim that they um, misunderstood or didn't understand that the other party wasn't consenting. So that defence is now removed, um, and um, and and alongside the other instructions that the that the judges can give to juries, I do think this is a, it is a fairly significant improvement. Um, but there is also the need for uh, genuine education around sexual assault and sexual assault consent. What is it? What does it mean? How do you do it in an affirmative way? I would absolutely def definitely not suggest an app. It, it just means that they have to, to, everybody has to learn how to take steps to affirm consent mm. um, in in sexual encounters and now in, in the 21st century we i think it's incumbent on fathers to be teaching their sons right and it's incumbent on 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 lots of people to be to be coming much more upfront about what is consent i really think that our sexual assault education schools which has been pretty abysmal and then the, the national campaigns around sexual assault have been absolutely ridiculous that milk you remember the milkshake um, ad the other week? Absolutely absurd. So, you know, we have a lot to go on um, improving our education of the public, mm. children and parents. Everybody needs to step up here. Right. And the, the, the shift, as you said, an accused person's belief in consent won't be reasonable. That's been the test. Is that's, it that's reasonable? Cool. And that it is... won't be reasonable now unless they said or did something to ascertain consent. I want to go to the question, um, Patrick, of attitude to the jury, because this is a significant, like, cultural issue um, and one of community mm. attitudes and community behaviour. And in this law reform report... Um, that Attorney General Mark Speakman referred to. Um, there was an analysis of Victorian rape trials between 2008 and 2015 and found that Defence Counsel often relied on the complainant's unrelated behaviour before sexual activity to construct a narrative of consent. Um, this includes walking near, sitting next to the accused person. Um, some jurors regard certain behaviours as implying a willingness to engage in sexual activity. Inviting, which includes inviting the accused person home and remaining in the accused person's company for a prolonged period. So, to address this, there's five new instructions to jury. The first, retain the meaning of consent as free and voluntary, and it has to be present at the time of sexual activity, not before, not after, at that time. A person can withdraw consent at any time. It, to make it clear if a person consents to one sexual act, they don't consent to other sexual acts. To clarify definitions of sexual intercourse, sexual touching and sexual act. And to clarify that a defendant cannot rely on self-induced intoxication to show they were mistaken about consent. How significant are those directions? And, and, and what will that mean for, for mounting a defence? Well, look, I, I welcome those directions and anything to make uh, the situation clearer uh, is, a, is, a, is a step forward. Now, the pro problem is that when you've got a jury that comes in, they're independent and they bring their own 
uh, personal experiences to the table. So once again, it comes back to, it doesn't matter how many directions the judge can give and how strenuous he can put them before a jury, they are still need the education in relation to consent, what amounts to positive consent, mm. and also um, the issues surrounding the previous behaviour and whether or not to take that into account. Contextually, though, when, when you say people following around and, and, and those sort of mm. issues, mm. Um, that's a problem. But how can you sit there and say to a jury in relation to flirtatious behaviour, that's just flirtatious behaviour, it does not mean an invitation for sex. And that's where I think that direction's leading. But anything that clarifies the law in relation to these issues can only be a positive step forward. Right, and also we're talking about the need for cultural change, but to, to both of you, we, you know, what we've seen in the last year, I mean, when it, but before that, when it came to Saxon Mullins, mm -hmm. Brittany Higgins, Chanel Contos, a discussion about consent that's been, that I've never seen before. Mm. Do you think this will get men talking more about what it means, Isaiah? Yeah, I think, look, I think at the end of the day, we need, we need to have proper education to, to lead into proper uh, prevention. Mm. And we see that within our schools. You know, we can see that there is insufficient um, education with sexual, sexual um, assault. Uh, you know, even through my own schooling, I didn't really you know, get that proper education as well um, growing up. And I think it's important that we do. And, and you know, we can see that by one in six um, females have been sexually assaulted. And that, you know, that's huge. You know, pretty much all of us here, it shows that we know people who have been um, who are, who have assaulted uh, women, and so it's important for us to to educate. And you know, even for an organisation uh, ourselves, that I do know yourself, you know, uh, us males are asking the women, and I think that's what it comes down to: listening mm -hmm. to women and uh, and not trying to be the experts at this. Mm. You know, we're not, and uh, clearly, and so it's about listening to women and and making sure that we are taking the appropriate steps to, to ensure that the future generations as well um, are aware of their actions. And, and so, for, in, for example, at ID, not only as an organisation, but our kids, where we've got Femme Power, and we locked that in a while ago, who, who are running some um, sexual, uh, uh, sexual consent and um, uh, workshops yeah. in our sessions to make sure that, and, and, and gender as well, uh, quality to make sure that these kids um, are properly equipped and yep. got the tools. Yep. Um, but even culturally, you know, I think, um, you know, as matriarchal people, mm. Aboriginal people, you know, it's respect for our women has been ingrained in our culture. And it's about making sure that our, our young men um, uphold those values. Mm. Amy, you seemed to nod firmly when he said, listen to women. Yeah, well, I, I, I just get really excited about the positive conversations we're having around consent. Yeah. Um, if you're an advocate for protecting children, then you tend to be across this. So, like, I have done my very best to be raising my children up to understand their right to bodily autonomy. So from as soon as they were old enough to kind of be talking, they've been taught from my head to my toes, I say what goes. So my child can be as adorable as they want to be. You do not have a right to touch them. Mm -hmm. And you know, I have a six year old who doesn't want to give mum kisses at the moment. And as much as that breaks my heart, I hide that because <laughs> that is his right. Yeah. And I think teaching children that they have agency over their bodies, teaching them about consent in these little tiny ways, you know, like that is yours and that's yours. Like, it's not okay for me to just take that. It's not okay for me to force kisses and cuddles on you just because I want it. Because from your head to your toes, you say what goes. And I just think that, you know, these conversations like Kerry was saying, and, and as we're hearing from the other panelists about education, mm -hmm. I can see some really wonderful things coming up. And I'm hearing excellent conversations, um, you know, through the, the men in my life and the women and non-binary people in my life when it comes to, okay, in terms of sexually charged interactions, what does consent look like? And one of the things that I've heard is, oh, but won't that kill the mood? No, consent can be sexy. And I'm hearing these wonderful workshops that are putting that forward. This new normal is what we need, a new normal around what is consent and what is bodily autonomy. And I just think that these There's changes- There's momentum and things Yeah, indicate happening. momentum yeah. and yeah. opportunity going forward. Yeah. Well, Patrick, uh, great to have your expertise tonight. Why don't you come back on the show in a few months' time and tell us how it's all panning out? No, it'll be interesting to see how it yeah. is and it does work in, in reality. Great. Patrick Schmidt, thank you very much. Patrick Schmidt is a defence lawyer and former police prosecutor.
So Brittany Higgins, alleged rape in a minister's office and the many inquiries announced after she came forward have been front and centre in political proceedings today. Labor Senators Penny Wong and Katie Gallagher were left dumbfounded after confirming the remit of the inquiry being conducted by the PM's department secretary looking into what the Prime Minister's office knew about Ms Higgins' case. No power of compulsion, no co confidentiality agreement with PMO staff, lawyers for PMO staff, no end date, no commitment to release the report. Do you really think this is how government should operate? Because all of that, all of that and all of this contest just to find out <laughs> whether the PMO knew. So, so, Senator really? Wong, you, so and many, you, and, you and many others have asked questions. There's a lot of effort Mr. going Gaitchen's into not much giving effort. any is, information. That's exactly that Mr right. Gaitchens is seeking independently and thoroughly to answer. No, it, what it looks like mm -hmm. is exactly as Senator Gallagher said, that there's an incredible amount of effort going into not providing those answers. Scott Morrison was also quizzed in Parliament about whether his office had briefed the media against Ms Higgins' partner. Thank you, Mr Speaker. My question is to the Prime Minister. A short time ago, Simon Birmingham told Senate estimates the Prime Minister's Chief of Staff has briefed the Prime Minister on his findings about whether the Prime Minister's office briefed against Brittany Higgins' loved ones. Can the Prime Minister now finally tell us did his office seek to undermine Brittany Higgins' loved ones? Thank you, Mr Speaker. <laughs> My Chief of Staff found in the negative and I table the report. Thank the Prime So the report he's referring to there was compiled by the Prime Minister's Chief of Staff, John Kunkel. It found there wasn't enough evidence that negative briefing against Ms Higgins' partner had taken place. Let's return to the Kunkel uh, report in a moment, John. What I want to ask you is... We have Penny Wong there outline the limitations of this internal inquiry um, by the Gaitchen's inquiry into no end date, no confidentiality agreement, no, no, no commitment to release the report. Why do we have an inquiry into a department that you run, let alone two inquiries into a department that you run, that's internal? How can we have public confidence in that process? Yeah, look, I think this issue has been top of mind for Australians for many months now, and I, I've said publicly, uh, I think even the last time we might have spoken, that I, I think the government should be conscious of the public's expectation that it will receive you know, the details of the outcome of that report and that investigation. I don't think, you know, days like today assist that process. I think the public are expecting it and anything less than that won't meet those expectations. So I certainly think uh, the government should be looking at putting something out there in the not too distant future and as soon as possible, frankly. I think, I think uh, you know, those expectations are very clear. Um, Amy, can I ask you about the, the Kunkel report mm. and, and what you make of it? Not enough evidence um, was found to support those claims. At the same time, he says he does not mean to deny that Ms Higgins is not sincere with, with, you know, and having honest beliefs that that did happen. Also pointed out that there were some editors and journalists from news outlets mentioned in Ms Higgins' letter who either didn't respond or declined to participate in the process. Yeah, I think one of the difficulties when it is an internal review um, is the reliability. But then when we read some of the sentences there, like things like corridor chatter, mm. I found myself thinking, yeah, but what, what would it look like to substantiate it? Because if we're passing around information, if we're backgrounding people within our own, like if that conversation's happening within our own department or within our own um, limited community, that is where those conversations happen. You're not like you're not going to be silly enough to be putting it in writing in emails where you could then have it reviewed. They're, they're conversations that are happening in those informal settings intentionally. Uh, and I think this brings us back to the problems with it not being an independent reviewer because it's a different, it's a completely different relational standpoint. Like, uh, you know, as a researcher, I think about the ethics that we have to go through when we're doing projects and the stakes are not this high. Um, it just seems really unethical and unreliable and it, 
yeah, I just, what else would it look like other than things like corridor chatter? Like, what does that mean? Yeah, based on a presumption that passing corridor chat is accurate. That's what he said. And the journalist stated they had a passing conversation with a member of the press gallery um, in which it was said the Prime Minister's office relied on blah, 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 was talking about the background. He's basically saying that it was a live discussion yeah. about the allegations she made, whether they were correct or not, and apparently her, her own personal circumstances. How would this go down in your university department, Kerry? Oh, look, um, it would not pass, um, Master. Um, it's like the police investigating the police, mm. the, mm. the cookie monster in charge of the cookie jar. <laughs> um, you, you think about it, I'm sorry, it, it really does not pass, Master. And the kind of ethical standards to which we have to account for, um, uh, you're not allowed to investigate yourself. And that, that's a basic principle of independence. And I don't think anybody's going to take much notice of these internal um, inquiries which have no um, external scrutiny. Mm. I don't want to draw too rough a bow or I'm mixing my metaphors there, um, Isaiah, but as someone who's like working with people in and out of foster care, trying to keep them out of the criminal justice system, working out that the, the slightest of things can lead you to homelessness or incarceration, does it... Does it ever rankle with you that there can sometimes be a, a, a culture of impunity? By this, I don't suggest that this is an incorrect report. I don't know. I didn't investigate it and we don't know who was spoken to. There's a lot of evidence missing from it. But does that... Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I mean, as well is, uh, you know, a lot of time we say, for me, I'm like, well, the kids, they have a voice and the difference between them being heard is a platform and that platform has to be taken seriously and um, that platform has to be a trusted platform as well. And, and quite, as I said, you know, the police investigating the police, um, you know, there needs to be, I, I believe, someone to externally to investigate and, and truly find out what's, up, what's going on. Mm. Is, John, is backgrounding against someone who's in the public eye after having alleged like a serious sexual assault, backgrounding against her partner, if that had been found to be sufficient evidence for that, is that a sackable offence? Uh, look, it could be, but who knows without all of the facts. Mm. I mean, and briefing briefing journalists um, can take so many different forms. I'm not defending it. I don't know what was in the report. I, I have to, you know, so I haven't read it. So sure. uh, I'd rather want to read it before I make too much of a comment on it. But just generally, the sorts of conversations that can be taken as briefing can vary. So, um, sure, at, at the very serious end, yeah, it could be something as serious as that, but, but also, the, you know, the, the range of different forms of briefing, in my experience, that they can take when you've got somebody who, who might be saying something to some person having a particular view about what they're meaning and what they're conveying, yep. and the recipient of that information have a totally different view and maybe, you know, a, a, you know, a different purpose or As whatever. Would so yeah, or, did, or in this case, might not have also given evidence. But I just we just need to end it there. But I want to say that if you've been affected by anything we've been discussing, call Lifeline on 13 11 14 or 1800 RESPECT on 1800 737 732. And that is it for tonight. We got through so much. Thanks to our panel, Isaiah Dorr, Amy Tunick, John Pizzuto and Kerry Carrington. Thanks so much for a fabulous chat. You can have Ellen with you tomorrow night. Have a great night.